I used to do a lot of deep sea fishing when I lived in uh, California, so I fished all up and down the coast uh, many hours out. We Sometimes we'd leave at midnight and go you know, out to where we couldn't see land, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, one time before I came here, one of my friends was a commercial fisherman. Uh, he had a, a, a boat called a skipjack, uh, and so we went out on his professional grade boat, me and uh, three other guys. That was, it's better than a party boat when you got 60 lines you're contending with. And just you and four guys, it was totally cool. So we went out uh, underneath the San, San Francisco Bay Bridge, to, uh, turned north, went along the coastline uh, looking for striped bass. Had, had, a, had a, great, a great day. Um, caught a lot of fish, had a, had a big cooler we were throwing the fish into as we caught them. Uh, and as uh, it started getting dark, we decided, you know, uh, it, was, it was just too good a fishing to go in, right? So, uh, so my friend, uh, the captain, said, you know, you should be able to find, you know, the entrance to the, the bay again. Um, well, it got started getting really dark really fast, and there's huge ocean liners out there. You're in a little tiny boat, you know, you don't, do, they don't, I don't know if they even see you. Uh, and so we were uh, out there cruising around, and we decided we should probably start heading back. We had a ways to go to get to the mouth of the bay. And so uh, we opened up the engine, took off, uh, and, we're, and the little bu buoys that are floating off the coast uh, have a, a radio beacon connected to them. So we were kind of triangulating where we were in the darkness to each beacon uh, that was on those floating buoys. Um, and then it started getting foggy. That's what it does in San Francisco. And you can see the fog layer, the marine layer coming in. And I'm from San Diego. I've seen it many times. Here it comes. And then I know what happens next. It comes in, and then it just, it's like an elevator. It just lowers. And so we are just wide open engines, uh, you know, flying across the, the water. Because we see, you know, it's getting dark, and here comes the marine layer. Uh, and it started dropping down, and it was, it was brutal. We're like, I don't even know if we're able to see where we're going when that happens. Well, it started dropping, and uh, I remember when we uh, caught the Point Bonita lighthouse uh, on the upper cliff on the north side of, uh, of the bay. Uh, you can see the uh, Point Bonita lighthouse. There's a picture of it. Of course, it wasn't that bright when we were driving by there. Uh, and you can see there's rocks out in the ocean and stuff. You definitely don't want to hit one of those going 40 miles an hour. Uh, but you can see the, the strobing light uh, uh, in, the, in the mist of the clouds, in the darkness, was this beautiful light spinning around. And we're like, thank God for that. That's a sermon illustration. <laughs> Isn't it? Because, you know, as I think about that night, and when we came into the bay, I mean, there's other lights you could follow as we went back to safety, as it were. Uh, as I think about the study of the Psalter and all that we're called to do, woven all throughout the Psalms has been the call to praise God. And I went through and counted them all up this week uh, in my Hebrew uh, program. Uh, and I, I, I won't read through all of them. Uh, but I put all of the times in the Psalter, in my notes, you can read tomorrow, of where we're called to praise God. It is the message of the Psalms, that you are, you are born to praise God. And I, I think about uh, my life as a Christian, uh, it's much like that lighthouse. Uh, we live in a very dark world, and what is my responsibility but to shine like a strobing light to those around me who need the safety of the harbor, which is the gospel of Christ, uh, and they need to be led home, don't they? Uh, and your, your praise can be like that strobing light, because all of the, the great praise that we've seen in the book tells you about the purposes of God, tells you about the character of God, and who as a non-Christian couldn't hear those things and see that that's the light they need for life. So as, a, as you also think about a light, lighthouse, uh, it, it's not a constant beam, it, it strobes. And that's what you see as you read Psalm 147, uh, your praise should strobe. Because it's too busy. You're, I mean, all day long you got, you're got you commuting, you're, you know, you're busy, phone calls, emails, texts. I mean, who can stop and praise God all day long? It's, that would be impossible, wouldn't it? I mean, it would be great. Maybe in heaven you can uh, when you don't have a job and you just got tons of time. But in Psalm 147, you see the constant call to praise uh, that as you think about him and the things that he's done in your life, uh, you're like that lighthouse to strobe out to the world the greatness of God. And God also sees that light and he, his smile is upon you when you praise him. So we, we return back to what we talked about last week, that believers should pulsate in praise to God. That's why you're made, that you should pulsate in praise. There are three panels in the structural analysis of the passage that we've looked at. We looked at panel one, where he talks about praising God for his compassion and his character. Uh, and then in, that's the first six verses. And we're going to move past those. And each, each one of these, is, it's very symmetrical in how it's structured. There's a call to praise with imperatives. Uh, and then there's causes of praise to tell you the reasons why you should praise God. Very logical. So if you're a logical, systematic, orderly person, this, this psalm is for you. Panel number two. We want to move on and look at what, uh, what I call praise God for uh, his focus and for what I would call his favor. That's verses uh, 7 through 11. 
And then in panel three, we'll look at praising God for his involvement in our lives and the insight he gives us into living. So let's look at them in that order. Uh, praise uh, panel number two. You praise God for his focus in the world and his favor. Verse one, or ver verse seven says, uh, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, sing praises to our God with the lyre. Uh, two imperatives in the Hebrew text calling us to uh, step forward and make sure that our lives praise God. And the word to praise Hallel uh, means to raise something higher than yourself. So you are as a, a finite person saying, God, you're greater than me. And in my praise of you, I raise you up to where you are. He tells you twice to sing praises. Now, the second time he tells you sing praises, he uh, uses a different Hebrew uh, command, different word, uh, which is a word used for musical instruments. So how many here play some kind of musical instrument? Just confess now. I won't hold you to it. You do, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you, do you, I didn't see over here. It was so quick. It was like, yes. Okay, you do? Okay. So I have two questions. Do you use it to praise God? Do you use it to praise God? And do you use it to praise God in corporate worship? Oh. <laughs> That's a whole nother one. Oh, yeah, I totally praise God with my instrument. I, there's no way I would step up on a stage and do that. It's a little different when you come up here, right? Everybody's staring at you. Suppose you hit a fall, you know, wrong note. If, you're, if you play a flute, somebody probably plays it better. And it's like, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to audition, all that kind of stuff. He, he says on here, it's a command. It's not a suggestion in the Hebrew text. Uh, it, 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 sing praises to our God with a lyre. Not L-I-A-R. <laughs> L-Y-R-E. Uh, that's some kind of stringed in instrument, kind of like a harp. So those are long gone. I'm not assuming anybody here plays one of those anymore. But you all just said you play something, right? I see those hands again. How many plays? <laughs> see, okay, now he's like he's messing with my life. Yeah, okay. So he said sing praises to God. So do it individually, so privately. That's a little easier to do, right? You know, the wife and the kids can hear me play the piano, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's one thing. But just going on stage, you're kidding me. Um, so I went home this week because you have to kind of live your sermons, you know. And I have a new piano, a new Yamaha. I love it. Um, and I play every day. Uh, but I, I just stopped, you know, playing some of the stuff I was uh, playing, uh, some of the rock stuff I like and jazz things. Uh, and I got out the, the, the hymnal and just started thumbing through the hymnal and just, you know, playing my favorite stuff. Who was I playing for? Not for me. That was between me and God. It's worship. And uh, so I do that. But uh, when you get the opportunity to use your instrument for God, then use it. So here's my suggestion. Uh, Danita uh, is uh, in charge of our worship team. Uh, she's always looking for qualified people to help her fulfill the biblical mandate. <laughs> this is good, isn't it? Just kind of work this right in there. So uh, her email address, you should have a pen in your hand right now. Pin, Donita, D-O-N-I-T-A, Donita, at BurkeCommunity.com. Swamp her mailbox. You know, and if we have, like, in the next couple of weeks, you know, like, 15 you know, people playing oboes up here, or something, I don't know. Uh, but, hey, just tell her, hey, I, I, I'm game to audition. It seems scary. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but, but give it a shot, because you should be using it for God. That's my point, uh, because that's the command of Scripture. Sing to God with thanksgiving. Sing with, with a lyre, or you can put your instrument in there. Now, we'll move on for that, because it's too convicting. Let's go do the, the causes. Like, why, sh why should I praise? Uh, verses 8 to 11. Well, who is God? What is he like? Well, he's the God who covers the heavens with clouds, who provides rain for the earth, and who makes grass to grow on the mountains. I mean, you, this is complex, but simple at the same time. So if you think about God, who spoke the entire cosmos in, into uh, existence, all that complexity, all that magnificence and beauty... He's concerned especially about the crown of his creation, mankind, on one planet uh, that he takes care of them. And how does he take care of us? Well, he makes sure that we have, what does he say there? That you have clouds, uh, and you have rain, and you have grass. Do they go in that order? This is a scientific church. What say you? Yeah. I mean, you can't reverse the order because the, the grass wouldn't grow because it didn't have any water. So... We all know how this works. I have a chart in case you don't know. What would be a service without a chart? <laughs> so I came to church to learn science. So there was lots of complicated charts, and I'm like, I want, I want the, 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 you know, the life cycle for dummies chart. So this is it. Okay, here we go. Water cycle. How does it happen? Water evaporates as it's heated up by the sun, goes into clouds that, you know, form from the water as it, it rises. Uh, it there's, pr pr provides for condensation. Then it comes over. Burke, and then it just dumps here, right? Pre precipitation. 
goes back into the rivers and lakes, et cetera, and then it's collected again, and that's, just a, that's constant cycle. Is that happening on any other planet? No. And it just, after a massive cosmic explosion, just happened to land here. Uh-huh. Right. Well, who's, who's in charge of that system? God. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? I just kind of wish he'd make the clouds go away so the hun, sun could heat up the planet a little bit more where we live. But, but, it, but it's the way that God is. So we praise him. Why? Well, because, because of his focus. He's focused on clouds. I mean, he's focused on rain. And I love it. It just said he's focused on... He loves grass. Now, I know many of you are going, I thank God my lawn is dormant right now. That is not spiritual. Okay. <laughs> Man, I'm looking at my lawn going, I'm seeing it's kind of changing. I got, a, I got a big bag of fertilizer. I got to go hit it. I got to pop it. I got to wake it up, et cetera. I'm so excited. I almost took the mower out yesterday and mowed, but I thought my neighbors would think I'm insane. So I, so I took out my weed eater, fired it up, got it going, weed eated my whole yard. That's dead. Dormant, just felt good. Two cycle oil mix in the morning. Um, but I'm just serious. I mean, can't you thank God for little things like that? Sure, you can, because he's he's concerned with dwarf fescue. I don't know what you're doing. He, he says, "Praise God." Why? Well, he's the one that makes all of this possible. He he's concerned about us. Now, think about clouds for a minute. Uh, what kind of clouds are there? Well, lots of kind. Here they are. One simple chart. <laughs> what do we usually see? Cumulus clouds, stratus clouds, stratocumulus clouds, etc. But if you go up into your, how many are pilots? I know you're here because I've talked to some of you. Your pilots? There's more than one. Yeah, okay, I, I see you now. Yes, thank you. Okay, so you have probably flown through some of these, right? Because you get up to like the 40, well, 45,000 foot level, but, but you're flying through all those cirrus clouds and cirrocumulus clouds. They're awesome. My favorite is the massive, you know, one on the right, see that? It just goes, it's like the giant thunderhead. Whenever I see those and I'm flying in a plane, I look out the window, I'm like, it's the might of God. I mean, I just stare out the window. It's just, it's just too awesome. It's just, I don't know what you're, who would be watching a movie when you could be looking out the window going, man, look at the finger of God. And so he says, praise God who puts those giant clouds there uh, because he's the, pri he's the primary cause. Now, scientists can sit and explain to you well, that's a cirrus cloud, and there's a cumulus cloud, and the cumulus cloud flies at 6,500 feet. And they can get, explain all that, but why is it there? God. God is the primary cause, so you give him praise. It says in verse 9, remember he's telling you the reasons why you praise God. He focuses on little things like this. It says he gives, he gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens which cry. He cares about animals. Now you're thinking, yeah, I feed my dog, and he would die if I wasn't around, Right? I mean, my dog has a built-in clock, little Riley, 15-pound fur ball. Uh, at 5, 5.30, he just knows it's time for dinner. He goes and gets his bowl and stands there with it in, in front of you. And he'll drop it in front of you like if you don't have your act together. Does he have a watch? No, he just knows that that's when he gets something in the microwave, and it's going to be awesome, etc. I can't give the dog cold food, but I'm sorry. I have to heat it up. <laughs> but when I'm doing that, <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I just feel sorry for him. You know, so, you know, you, you're feeding the dog and you're thinking to yourself, he would die if I was not here. But you are the hand of God, are you not? What did he just say? God, he, he gives beasts their food through you. What about the ones that you're not responsible for? Think of all the animals that are in the world. I mean, out in the bush, the deer, etc. I mean, who's feeding them, God? Think about it. He is so busy with the cosmos running it, but he's concerned about all the animals on the planet that he put here. Are they getting a meal? He's concerned about that. What is the logical deduction? If he is concerned about all the animals out in the forest, out in the jungles, finding food, what does he think about you? What does he think about you? A lot. A lot. It says that he's even concerned about the young ravens which cry, the little birds, you know, they build a little nest and hatch, you know, the little, you know, the little birdies in there. And he's, he's even concerned about them. Now, I know many of you have bird feeders, they're really squirrel feeders, but you have a bird. <laughs> I learned my lesson here until we bought the kind of squirrel feeder that if the squirrel jumps on it, his weight makes it slide closed. That was awesome. Uh, but it's like, you know, it's insane because, because you, you put out a little bird feeder and you feed the birds and you, you're touching the planet, right? You're being the hands and feet of God, right? But there's, there's an estimated 430 billion. 
trillion birds on the planet. You're just taking care of a small little fraction of them. Who's taking care of the rest of them? God. God. I mean, it's just like, what do the birds do all day? Have you, do you think about these things? I mean, what do they do all day? They're hanging out in trees, hang, standing on, you know, power lines, you know, staring at you in traffic, those losers. I'm glad we're not them. I mean, whatever they're doing, I mean, that's a bird. But the bird's looking down thinking, man, you know, what am I going to eat? That's what they're thinking. Who's taking care of them? God. God. Again, what's that mean to us logically? Well, if God takes care of all of the animals on the planet and he's taking care of all the little birds who are ca crawling for their mom to bring in some food, aren't you more important than a bird? Yeah, because he's focused on you. He's focused on you. So uh, the point would be, what are you worried about? This is what Jesus says in the, his first Sermon on the Mount. You know, if he takes care of the lilies of the field and the little birds, aren't you of much more importance? Answer, yes. So why are you worried? Uh, you praise God because he's focused at that level. He's also a praiseworthy because of what he does in verse 10. It says he does not delight in the strength of the horse, and he does not take pleasure in the legs of men. This is bizarre. Huh? He doesn't delight in the strength of a horse. Uh, do you like horses? I didn't grow up with horses. When I started my PhD in Hebrew, when I was 27, Liz and I went to a dude ranch in Houston. I had to go ride. We're from San Diego. We don't ride horses. We, we go to a dude ranch. First day out, we paid to go ride horses in the forest. Bad mistake. We were there a week. We couldn't walk. <laughs> Literally. We tried to rent a paddle boat. We couldn't paddle. I was so sore. Have, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, the strength of a horse. I got on this horse, and the Texas cowboy looked at me and goes, Sir, do you want this thing to run? Run? No. I want it to walk slowly through the forest. I don't even know what I'm doing here. And once it gets going, how do I stop the thing? Where's the brake pedal? I mean, what? You know, the strength of a horse. You know how strength can pick up and pull three times its weight. Now, this is supposedly the strongest horse on the planet, a Belgian draft horse. It's huge. It can pull 8,000 pounds. Its mouth has biting pressure of 500 PSI. It's in Wikipedia. Check it out. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Uh, and you think about the strength of a horse, it's like, man, that is just off the grid. When God looks at the horse, what does God think about the power of the horse? Eh, no big deal. I made the horse. How about the legs of a man? Are you, ladies, are you married to, like, a really stud of a guy? I'm giving you help right now. It's your opportunity. Yeah, yeah, okay. Because well, you know this is going to go south on you, right? Yeah. Uh, now, now think about it. There, there's a guy named Tom Platts, and Tom Platts is called the Quad Father. Quad Father? <laughs> and <laughs> I was going to show you pictures of Tom, but I can't in church. Just trust me. <laughs> His legs do not look human. They are rippling muscle, bulging muscle, and it's like I told my wife, hey, uh, they superimposed my legs on this particular website. She just laughed at me, you know? I mean, when... <laughs> Here's the thing. Uh, most gym rats, uh, not, in fact, 95% of all gym rats will never achieve what is called the 1,200-pound three-lift total. What's that? That's being able to lift a, a, a combined bench press and squats and deadlifts that total 1,200 pounds. 95% of men won't do it. That means 5% of men do it, and they're all in our church. It's totally awesome. Uh, <laughs> and it said very, very few will actually hit the 1,500-pound uh, uh, three-lift total. But some do it. I mean, but when God looks at the strength of a man, what does God think when he looks at how powerful the man is? He's, is it? well, it's, you know, it's no big deal to me. I keep the planets in orbit. You know, we, we, you know I, I grew up lifting weights and living in gyms and lifting and all the stuff I did for sports. I mean, there was always guys like pick up the stack or whatever. And you're like, whoo, you are the man. What does God think? I can pick up the building. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's no big deal. Uh, we, we look at temporary things, and God looks at things way beyond that. Because what does God think about? It says in verse 11 what God thinks about. It says, the Lord favors those, not who can bench, you know, 475. Uh, God favors those who do what? Fear him. Uh, and who wait for his loving kindness. He, he fears those people. Those are the people that he looks at. So think about this. You could be the weakest person in the room, physically speaking. Uh, you could be the slowest woman on the track team in high school. I mean, it doesn't matter where you're at. But if you love God and put him first, well, his focus is especially on you because that's who he's looking at, not the, uh, the person inflated by their body size and how great they are, how fast they are. God doesn't care about those things because what happens in time? The muscles shift, right? 
you're constantly telling your children, this chest used to be up here. <laughs> now it's down there. My biceps used to be, you know, I had a tattoo up here. I'm not talking about myself, but I had a tattoo up here. It's now a bracelet. It's moving, <laughs> you know, right? So that you think that this, this is not praiseworthy because man is, he's temporal. God, no, he says, do you love me and put me first? Do you fear me? Then I show favor to you. That's who I look at. You might not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, smartest person in the room, most qualified, most degrees, whatever. And God says, no, do you love me? Do you love me? Then that is what I'm really keyed on. Aren't you glad he's that way? Because what's the world focused on? All that other stuff. I mean, you will probably never look like Arnold in your lifetime. I'm speaking of not Arnold Palmer. I'm talking <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, okay? Uh, Kendall uh, Jenner, she gets 2,740,000 uh, web looks per day. You will probably not get that many in your lifetime. Does it matter? No. What matters? Well, that you love God and you fear him, which means that you then obey him, and then, then that's what matters to him. And so you praise him because he's a God that's got the right focus. He's, he's got his, his focus on the right things in life, and he he's, shows great favor to those who love him. And so you have a special place, place in his heart. That's worthy of praise. Panel three, last panel. Praise God for his involvement in your life and his insight that he gives you. Uh, call to praise, again, another command. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise, O God, you Zion. Two, praise, two commands, again, to praise God. Uh, why does he have to keep giving us commands? <laughs> well, we tend to forget. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you just, you left service last week thinking, okay, I know I need to praise God. Oh, squirrel. <laughs> And you're, you're totally distracted because uh, we get distracted so easily by things, right? And you're like, man, I got to get back to praising God. So he gives you two more commands in Hebrew. To, you need to remember what you're supposed to be doing is praising God uh, and, and lifting up his name. But here he focuses on Jerusalem. I mean, their capital city, Zion, just the code word for Jerusalem. Uh, and he's going to tell you here in this particular uh, concept, let me give you the reasons to praise the, the God that's the God of Jerusalem or the God of the nation. Uh, that's going to be the causes of praise in verses 13 to 20. These are interesting. Uh, he's going to tell you two things here. Number one, God is involved in our lives. And number two, God gives insight to his people for living. So let's look at them in that order. Verse 13, causes for praise. Uh, for uh, this, the reason, that uh, preposition tells you the reason why you should praise God. He has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your sons within you. What does that mean? Bars of your gates is a, is a code word for military armament. So he blesses your military, the strength of your protection of your city, i.e. like Jerusalem, having uh, gates and towers and walls, etc. Uh, you might build that military armament for fortifications, but if you really want to be protected, where does your protection come from? God, not the gate, not the wall, not the tower, not the, not the, not, not, not the tanks, not the plane, not the submarine. Are all those things important in a world that we live in? Absolutely. But what does a righteous person realize? No. The strength of all those things only comes from God himself to protect the people. And so that's what he says. He says, let me, let me pause and thank God who really protects our nation. We, we've built armies and things, uh, but God is the strength of the gates of our city that protect us. Because once the gate goes, the enemy is inside the gate. And so he says, I, I thank God he strengthens our gate. Because he said, the more that we focus on God as a people, the stronger God makes us in the, in, in the world to withstand our enemies. See, Israel had many enemies that surrounded them. Uh, one of my... Uh, uh, guides in Israel, uh, Asher, uh, Ashkenazi, uh, uh, former um, paratrooper, uh, ranger, and was trained by our rangers over here. Great guy. Multi-degree black belt. Great guy. Uh, we were sitting on the Golan Heights one time, and he, we were looking out over the Sea of Galilee, thousands of feet below, as the, as the tour group was hiking around taking pictures. And he looked at me, and he said, you know, Marty, uh, the Israelites, we, Jews, we are great people. We just live in a really tough neighborhood. Uh, yeah, understatement. Surrounded by your enemies. Uh, but the, the, the people that realize that, that God is your fortress really have a fortress. Because Israel's been attacked many times over thousands of years. There was a man, uh, a, a king named Sennacherib, who attacked Israel. Uh, and uh, he sent out his psychops guy, Rabshakeh. And uh, listen to what this guy says in psychops to the, the Jews on the walls of the cities. In 2 Kings 18, he says this. Then uh, Rabshakeh stood, the psychops guy, and he cried with a loud voice uh, in Judean, saying... Hear the word of the great king, this is uh, king of Assyria, Sennacherib. Uh, thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah, your king, deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you from my hand, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, 
The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Syria. Don't listen to your king. You're going down. We're the Assyrian army. We have you surrounded. We take no prisoners. It's over for you. Give up. Surrender. So the people heard that from Rabshakeh, and they go uh, talk to Isaiah the prophet. And Isaiah the prophet basically tells them, uh, this, uh, the Assyrians are not going to take your city, but you must humble yourselves before me. So they take that word uh, to the king. Notice what the king does it in 2 Kings 19. He takes the word from the prophet, and it says, Hezekiah did what? He assembled his cabinet, took a poll of the people, went to all the news sites, found out what they thought, went to politicians all around. No, what did he do? Mm -mm. Said he prayed before the Lord, and he said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who art enthroned above the cherubim, thou art the God, the God. Uh, thou alone of all the kings of the earth, thou hast made the heaven and the earth. He then has a request. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear this king, this politician. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see and listen to the words of Sennacherib, which he has set, sent to reproach the living God. God, he's not attacking just us. He's attacking you. And you are our God who, who blesses our gates. Would you come to our rescue? Did God hear him? Yeah, uh, certainly he did. Because if you read, uh, keep on reading, uh, we read this of what happened when God answered the prayer of the king. It says in Second uh, Kings 19, then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord, one angel, went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the man rose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead. <laughs> one angel. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home, and he lived at Nineveh. And it came about as he was worshiping in the house of his god, Nishrach, his god, that Adramelech uh, and Sherezer killed him with a sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat, and Asharadan, his son, became king in his place. What happened to the mighty, fearful, fearsome Sennacherib? God wiped out his army with one night. One angel passed through his camp. All soldiers died instantly. He then turned tail, ran back to Nineveh, while he's worshiping his false god there, his own men took him out. See, God said, if you put me first, I will protect you. Uh, I would say that's a great reason to pr for, well, for us to pray for politicians and leaders who put God first, who pray for God's protection. Because it doesn't matter how many missiles you have, how well your army is trained, how great your air force is, etc. Those are all great to protect us in, in evil times. But at the tip of the spear, are leaders who bow their knee to God Almighty and say, you are a throne above the cherubim. Protect us. That's good reason to praise, praise God. And he's, he pauses to give praise to God. And then he says in verse 14, he says, uh, you are the God who makes peace uh, in, in our borders. You make peace in our borders. Um, Israel did, the last thing they wanted were unsecured borders. Because remember, small nations surrounded by all their enemies. And to read their history is to read, they're surrounded by their enemies. They got the Egyptians on the south, they got the Edomites on the southern, uh, southeastern border. They got the Moabites. They got the Ammonites across the Jordan. Uh, you know, they got Og, king of Basham, way up in the north in the Golan Heights. I mean, they got the Syrians up there, you know, causing uh, havoc. I mean, on and on it goes. They did not want open borders. Why? Because with an open border, the enemy could cross over and kill their people, uh, uh, pillage uh, the cities, rob from the land, et cetera, et cetera. So they built cities. If you go with us to Israel, we'll show you the fortifications. They built them all around uh, the country to protect their borders. They built Megiddo uh, in the Armageddon Valley. They built Lachish, Shechem, Penuel, Ramah, Jerusalem, and etc. Uh, Masada, etc. They're, they're all over the country to protect their borders because a nation that doesn't have a border that protects them from their enemies is well nigh to destruction. And so he praises God here for making peace in your borders. I'm reading this thinking to myself, I was raised as a little kid watching my dad come home as a border patrol agent in a green uniform with his pistol, Every night. That's what he did. He worked at a, deten a detention facility. And then he took a test and, and uh, moved into U.S. Customs and then spent, I don't know, the next 30-something years in Customs. And now I think his position would be a director of ICE is what he was doing in Southern California. You know, I lived in this world of my father doing what he could to protect our borders because that's the prudent thing to do in an evil world, is it not? And so he says, God, we praise you for making peace in our borders. Because as we put you first, it doesn't matter how many great agents that we have, and we have many wonderful agents that protect our borders as they did. But at the end of the day, you need God to protect you. And so he says, God, might you protect us because we put you first. If I would have any advice to our country, it's put God back first. And then all these other blessings will come to us. 
He says, God, we praise you because you make peace in our borders. He says, God, in verse 14, you are also one who satisfies with the finest of wheat. I mean, you think, when I drove here 14 years ago from California and coming through, I'd never been through Nebraska, Iowa, all those states. I'd never been through them before. You ever been through Iowa? It's mind-boggling. It's like, how much wheat, I mean, how much corn is there? It's unbelievable. Harvesters to infinity, I mean, just bounty to infinity. And when you look at all that, the science, scientists can tell you, where did it all come from? But as a Christian, you're looking at it going, oh, man, the hand of God. He has blessed our great nation with much bounty. That's what he says. He satisfies you with the finest of wheat. Why? Because he wants you to be able to eat. So when you open your pantry and you're looking in there at all that's in there, you, it's a time to praise God. If you're in high school, listen to me. You're not just opening it to eat it all, okay? You're opening it and you're going, thank God my parents provided all this, but God sent all this food to me. Praise God. Because God gives you all of that bounty. He doesn't have to. He says, God, we praise you for that. Verse 15 I find most interesting. He says, we praise God for being involved in winter. I had a hard time with this. And notice what he says. He sends forth his command to the earth. His, his word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts forth his ice like fragments. Who can stand before his cold? He sends forth his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters to flow. Where does snow come from? <laughs> well, the scientists can tell you. And they can give you all the reasons uh, as to why snow does what it does. You know, it provides water provides protection for little seeds. It keeps them at the right temperature during the winter, and then it melts the outer crust of the seed so it can actually germinate and grow. I mean, it does lots of really great things. But he says when God speaks in the wintertime, uh, his word goes very swiftly. Boy, does it in the northern part of where we live. And all of a sudden, you get ice storms, you get snow, and all those things. So the next time you see all these things happen, you should stop with your snow shovel and do what? Call your high school son to take this out of your hand. So you can praise God. <laughs> no, it's just, it's just praising God. Praising God for even the things that are hard, like a frozen driveway, mine's on an incline. you got to be kidding me. But, but just praising God for what you have and what he does because it provides for you. And the thing is, if he's doing all of those things, how much more important are you than snow? He then says in verse 19, he, he moves on from that concept to talk about how God gives you insight. He says, he declares his words to Jacob. His statutes and ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation for his ordinances. They haven't known them. Think about it. He gave his revelatory words to Jacob. Remember we talked about him last week. Jacob had issues, didn't he? What kind of man was he? Probably not the one that you would pick. No, he, he was a deceiver. He was a liar. He was conniving. And God said, no, I'm going to use you with all your dysfunction to create a nation. That's the way God rolls. He says he declares his word, his revelatory word to Jacob and to every other one that, that followed Jacob. And then he gave his statutes, his law, his Torah to, and ordinances to Israel. Did he not? So think about it. Let's do a brief perusal of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. The revelatory light God gave us. What did he tell us in Genesis? In Genesis, he gives the Jews and us by proxy. In Genesis, he tells us how we got here. He tells us how we fell into sin. And then he promises that he's going to be, bring a redeemer. In Genesis. Uh, when you go to Exodus, he tells us that uh, he's, the Savior is going to come, uh, but, he, but he's going to tell you, uh, the Savior that's coming, uh, there has to be a place to worship God. See, Exodus is about the tabernacle. Worship God here. Uh, the book of Leviticus, that really tough book to read when you're going through the Bible in a year. Awesome book. What's that tell you? Well, Exodus tells you where to worship. Leviticus, Leviticus tells you how to do it. You must have the right blood sacrifice to cover your sin to walk into God's holy presence. That's Leviticus. Numbers, uh, it, this is about uh, the consequences of living in unbelief and not following God with faith. And then in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteros in Greek means second. Namos means law, second giving of the law to all the young people that rose up after their parents died in the wilderness for their unbelief. He gave them the law again to tell them, I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments and those 613, 14 extra commandments to tell, me, tell you exactly how to follow me. But you're not going to be able to follow all of the law because you're sinful and you're going to need a savior who can fulfill the law. See, he only gave one nation that revelation that was Israel. And that revelation has now been given to us. This is a huge privilege. And it should cause us to stop and say, thank you, God, for the Old Testament that, that talks of the savior. Thank you for the New Testament that tells us who the savior is. 
so that we as sinners can find salvation. And the last thing he tells you, in case you forgot, is what you should be doing. Uh, he closes with a command. What's the command? <laughs> you sound so excited. <laughs> well, praise God. Yeah. Yeah. No, what you do? It's simple. Praise the Lord. That's his final command. When I used to leave church uh, when I was a kid, I think every Sunday, we sang this song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Do you know this song? Yeah. yeah. We, why did Dr. Lind have us sing that when we walked out of church? Because isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? So I'm going to have you stand and individually sing this to God. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're going to sing it together. I'm not a singer, so you got to go with me. I don't have a piano, so we're, we're on our own on this one. Billy's not here. The team's not here. Do not let me down, right? You didn't say yes. You know. Thank you. Okay. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. May God bless you from this study. May you in turn bless him with your words of praise. Amen. God bless you.